Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love Online every Saturday. I hope some of you join us sometimes. It would be nice. All right. We are going to read from Hebrews chapter 3. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Father, please anoint your word and get out of it what you want us to get out of it. In Jesus' name I pray. We're going to start at verse 9 all the way to the end, 9 to 19, 10 verses. So y'all can wait through that. It'll be all right. It won't hurt you. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse 11, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, what they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they would not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not, let me repeat that, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. All right. So I just want you to think about that. Why do we have issues having a hard time believing God? What is it that makes it so difficult for us to put our trust in the Lord? What is it that, that makes us so fearful? You know, the word says that we're not to have a, a, a spirit of fear, but of a power and, a, and of a sound mind. We have to ask the Lord daily to help us build up our faith. And the only way our faith is going to be built up is by his word. So you must get into that word because it's like gassing up your car. You can run out of gas, y'all. I don't care how saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost you think you are. You can run out of fuel. And your fuel is the oil, the anointing. You do not want to run out of fuel. And you have to keep that living water flowing through you too. You do not want your radiator overheating. Because if you throw a rod, baby, that's the end of your car. And you want to make sure you do not throw a rod and do something stupid in your walk with, the, with Christ. Because of being driven by emotions. Now, emotions can be a blessing and emotions can be a curse. So you have to decide what you're going to go by. Because there, you know, there's one thing I noticed where God says in his word, he will strengthen and settle, strengthen, establish, and settle you. And it comes, that's a process. When we first get saved, we're, we're bringing all our baggage into the package deal. But what we don't realize when we first start out with the Lord is he is constantly cleansing, purging, he is constantly pruning, cutting off all the waste parts. He's um, <clears throat> sanctifying. He's purifying. He's doing everything he can, strengthening us on the inner man. He is delivering us. And uh, it's just so much that we go through by the fire of his Holy Spirit. And as the Bible says, some of us go through our process through the fire, through the fiery furnace. So, there's a lot of dead weight we need to get rid of. Just like the skin, it renews itself, what, every five weeks or something? And all that, all those dead skin cells, that's why you can rub your skin hard and 
roll up all his dead skin and, and fluff it off because your skin is constantly renewing. Well, it's the same thing in the spirit realm. God is constantly renewing us and we get renewed by what? The washing of the word of God. So when the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hmm. All right. You have to remember the renewing of your mind is a basic necessity. It's, 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 it's like you have to take a shower, y'all. You know, we all get real funky if we don't take a shower. And some of y'all, you don't take a shower often enough in the spirit. And you walk around with all kind of baggage and all kind of contaminants all over your spirit. And, and you're flinching and you're worried and you're fearful and you're, and you're upset and you're uptight and you run real tight. I mean, you know, you're like a spring that's tied up so tight you're about to pop. You don't know what to do. And you, 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 you go through these panics and you're putting this fire out over here and you're trying to figure that out over there and you're trying to handle that. What does Jesus say? What are you worried about tomorrow for? I'm putting it in my, in my terms now. This Pat Love paraphrase. What you tripping off or what could go wrong for tomorrow? You got enough problems right here in this day and hour to be worried about what if of tomorrow's, of next year of the afterlife, in other words, after this moment in time. I'm, I'm just being funny with that. But just understand, you don't have time to worry about what could go wrong. Because when you look at it in the scheme of things, when everything in your life is really in God's hands and you really have committed everything to God's care and you have truly cast all your care on, on him knowing that he cares for you, what you tripping off of? What are you worried about? What's up with that? That's what I'm asking you to think about. Because you need to go to God and say, Lord, why am I tripping? Why am I sweating bullets? Why am I sweating blood? Why are my veins popping out of my head? Why is my hair coming out by the root? Why am I frustrated at night and can't sleep through the night? Wake up, wake up, wake up. Thinking about this, thinking about that. What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? Oh, no, oh, no, Lord. And, 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 and almost every day, you're up in arms because you're wondering about the afterlife. I'm calling it the afterlife. I'm not talking about eternity, y'all. I'm talking about your future and your destiny. What's going to become of me? I think about it, every concern I have, I sit down and I talk to God. And when I talk to God, I make sure he knows I want him to talk to me. So when I get through, you know, the Bible in Psalms says, pour your heart out to him. So you can take authority left and right and, and, and go through all that. But let me tell you, when you really want to hear from God, you you cry from your gut. My husband used to call it a gully washing. You pull up from the, the gut of your sorrows and your fears, and you pull them out and say, Lord, I'm afraid. Be real. Don't say, oh, I can't say I'm afraid. I can't confess that. You better confess whatever you feel into God. Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. Lord, I don't want to be broke, busted, and disgusted. Lord, I don't want my body to break down and me be sick. I don't want to have this problem. I don't want to have my organs breaking down on me. I don't want this. I don't want that. Okay. Get it, get it all out before the Lord. He already knows it. But there's something about you pouring all that out to him that causes a tighter bond between you and him. And it gets his attention because you're crying out in faith. Even though you're confessing your fear, you're crying out in faith because you're talking to the right one who can make the difference. And he knows that you know that he's the only one that can. And that's why you're taking it to him. So you get it all off your chest. And then you don't stop there. You say, Lord, would you please 
lead me to scripture. I need you to calm my fears. I need you to settle my nerves. I need you to promise me that I'll be all right. I remember when the Lord challenged me to drop the food stamps and I wasn't happy about it. It was just an act of faith that God wanted me to go through. So don't y'all trip off of that. This is from between him and me. I still don't know why totally. I kind of suspect I know a little bit, but it's not your, it's not your case. This is a personal thing between me and God. So I cried. I cried. I said, well, Lord, how am I going to, I don't have it in my budget. Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord so clearly led me to a particular scripture with a particular number. And in that chapter, it said, and verily thou shalt be fed right there. And then I knew I was going to be all right. See, part of what our problem is, is we 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 spew out our fears. We 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 dump it all in his lap. But then after we dump it all in his lap, we think the conversation's over. And we haven't sat there and waited for his response. We haven't asked him for a response. We just get up and go on with our daily routine. Goes, okay, I spend time with the Lord. But that was a monologue. What happened to the dialogue? That goes both ways. My question to you. Is all you asking him, expecting an answer? Is that what you're doing? Like the other night, I wanted to buy a little food. I have to buy little things like canned soup and, and then add a little of this. And the main thing I nourish my body with is Shackley vitamins because that's where the real nourishment is for me. I get real good blood work with that. You know, nourishment, minerals, and all that, all those levels are always in an excellent place. So I'm more concerned with the nutrition than I am about the food. So sometimes I eat way below my own standards because financially, it's just, that's just the way it is for me right now, not being on food stamps. But my body is sustained by good nutrition, so I'm not lacking. But what God does, is when I'm putting in an order, I'll say, okay, Lord, how much can I spend? And I'll say, I'll see 60 something. So I know I got to stay below maybe 68 or $67. Stay below that and I'm safe because I know there are other expenses coming up through the month and my budget is tight. So I can't splurge. I can't spend two or $300 on monthly groceries like most of you do. Because I'm a widow on a fixed income, $981 a month. I'm, living, I'm a living miracle to own my own house, y'all. I'm a living miracle. So there are no complaints. My point is I trust God. That's my point. I trust God. And I thank him for the fact that he lives up to that trust. You hear me? I thank him for the fact that he lives up to that trust. So understand that God is not only not forgetful and he's not a man that he should lie. He's, he's truth all the way, baby. You can take every word he gives you to the bank. You can take every single word to the bank. There is no need for fear. Fear is not of God. Fear has torment. God is love. And perfect love casts out fear. So when you feel the fear rising, cast it out. Pour your heart out to God and cast it out at the same time. And then ask God to commune with you and share with you his word regarding your personal life. And if he's talking to David or the ministers or whatever, if he leads you to that scripture, if you get Psalms 27, when you're intimidated by somebody on your job or somebody in your family, and they make you feel like they can kick you out at any given moment, and you read Psalms 27 and it says, I shall not fear what man can do to me. Mm -hmm. So when, when God gives you those reassuring scriptures, you may not know what Psalms 27 says. But if God pops that number in the, in the word Psalms, or he pops a number in a word Proverbs, or, or he pops uh, Deuteronomy 6, or, or, or Isaiah uh, 40, 
anything like that. You go to that and read it. If it keeps coming to your mind while you're talking, you go to it and read it. Because nine times out of ten, God is dialoguing with you. But if you keep flapping at the jibs and get diarrhea of the mouth, don't give him a word in edgewise. Your answers won't come and then you're more frustrated because you got up more worried because you're like, okay, God didn't say anything. Well, shut up and let him. He's not going to interrupt you, baby. I'm not trying to be rude, but sometimes you got to get a point across with a crude expression. Shut up. <laughs> Clam it up, baby. <laughs> As Archie Bunker used to say, stifle it, eat it, stifle, stifle. <laughs> so listen, when you want to hear from God, see, those are the times you got to hear from him. You got to really hear from him. When I was trying to get the house on Mountain View to get into my name, you know, through probate. And I was asking God all about that. Lord, what do I do? You know, and I, and I was going through the steps he was leading me through. And then right the week after they, the attorney let me know that the house was officially in my name. The Lord leads me to scripture now. After all that, that says... The Lord shall choose your inheritance for you. Now, I thought that was it because six weeks before it was in my name, the Lord led me to a scripture that said where, where uh, I think it was Jacob was laying down and where his head was. The Lord said, where you lie, your, where you have laid your head or where you are lying or whatever, I have given that land to you. Well, I knew God was telling me that Mountain View is mine. But after Mountain View was in my name, listen to this. God spoke through a scripture that he led me to. Didn't know what it said till I read it. And when I read, I went to the book and went to the number of the chapter he put in my head to look at. And I read it. It said, God shall choose your inheritance for you. Right then, I was scratching my head because I'm thinking, well, this is my inheritance so maybe he's not talking about this. And I put that on the back burner, but I didn't forget it. And a year and a half, two years later, when the Lord let me know after going through all that foreclosure, that now it's time for you to know what I meant. And this is the house he chose. So, see, when you know that God is telling you he's got your future handled, He's got this covered. He's got that covered. Don't worry about that. You're going to be fed. Don't worry about that. I got a place for you to go. Don't worry about that. I've given you favor with these people. Don't worry about the other. There's nothing wrong with your body. Don't worry about this. I'm going to heal that. Don't worry about that. Your days of mourning are over. Don't worry about them. Your warfare is accomplished. Don't worry about your money. The Lord shall provide. Oh, I mean, come on. After a while, you start realizing for every worry I've got, he's got a word. And for every word he gives me, there's this that, that is the solution. All I have to do is believe it. That's all I have to do. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 7. I want you to hear what God's uh, position is on the times when we don't believe. Listen, Isaiah chapter 7. Go with me real quick. And then I'm just about done. Isaiah chapter 7. I'm going to read it real fast. I love the story. I love the story. Okay. I'm going to be a little dramatic so you understand because I love the King James. So I know I have to be a little dramatic for some who don't understand it. Okay. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Amalia, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it came, and it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved. In other words, he was scared out of his wits. And the heart of the people, as the trees of the wood, are moved with the wind. 
captain. That means they were shaking in fear, y'all. They were petrified. Verse 3, then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and, and Shirzerub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fullest field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint. Hearted for the two tails of those smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of resin with, with Syria and of the son of Remelia. Now, this right here is almost describing how scary a dragon would be in our face. A fiery breathing dragon. Oh, Lord, his tail is going to whip us and the fire is going to burn us. Oh. Okay, verse 5. Because Syria, and to see God saying, fear not. All right, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiah. Mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord God, and this is the magic wand right here, It shall not stand. Neither shall it come to pass. Ain't gonna happen, y'all. Ain't even gonna happen. All right. Verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within three score and five years will Ephraim be broken, that it be not even a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. In other words, there's one little monkey behind all that nonsense. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Now, what I say with that is... There are times when God tells you to bust the move, to go here, to go there, to do this, to do that, to stop this, to start that. And you're, huh, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And you wait, and you wait, and you linger, and you procrastinate because all you know is this. And finally, when you do bust the move, there's the answer. Oh, and you're blessed. And you're like, oh. Oh my God, look what I would have missed out on if I had not made that move. But how many of us don't ever move? We're frozen. We're paralyzed. Huh? How many of us are frozen in time? We're locked down by fear. We're locked down. Now, why is the fear there? Because what if this doesn't go right? What if that doesn't go right? What if I turn left and I have a car accident? What if I turn right and the police pull me over? What if I go over there and they don't like me? What if I go over here and they don't live up to their word? Then I'm left hanging, holding the bag. When has God ever led you anywhere and left you holding the bag? And then my question is, has God ever led you and you actually followed? Because you never know if God will never leave you holding the bag if you never follow where he's telling you to go. If you never obey what he's telling you to do. Because, see, we think through our little pea brains, our logic. We think how the system works. We think what the government says. We think what the neighbor says. We think what the law says. We think what this says and that says. What my mama told me all my life. What my papa told me all my life. What my brothers and sisters drilled into my head. I can't go beyond that because they said. But my question to you is, have you found out what God says? There's no fear in God's word. When God tells you something, baby, you can take it to the bank. You hear what I'm saying? You can take it to the bank. When God send the, sends a word through a prophet, when he told uh, Isaiah to go, to, I mean, when he told Isaiah the word for uh, Naaman to go dip, he had leprosy. He told him, go dip in that, in that sea or whatever it is, that river. He didn't want to go dip in there. Number one, he was irate. Because the prophet didn't even have the, the, the uh, respect for him to sit, to come himself and tell him face to face. 
thus saith the Lord. No, the, 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 the prophet sent his servant to, to send the message. I'm like, well, how dare you? Don't you know who I am? You better take your I am down to that river and wash that dog on leprosy off the way that messenger said, that servant said, because the servant brought the word that came from Isaiah, who got the word that came from God. And the authority is in the fact that it's a word from God, not in the messenger, not in the package it was wrapped in. Now, if he had been so irate and so indignant that he and so full of pride that he never dipped in that ocean, in that uh, sea, he would have died from leprosy. Some of you go through hell in your lives. Some of you go through hard times because God sent the word. You didn't appreciate the package. You didn't appreciate the style. You didn't appreciate the wherewithal of the message. And y'all, I know that ain't from God. I'm talking crazy. I... Yeah. And guess what? Now you're mad at God. Because you think God didn't come through for you. No. Sometimes God sends a word in season and out of season. And you have to decide whether you're going to be instant in season or out of season. Hmm. Because God's word is instant in season and out of season. It's worthy to be heard, heeded, and obeyed. There are some of you right now, you've got warnings from God. God told you to stop this, stop that, leave that alone, leave him alone, leave her alone. Hello, leave it all alone. Walk away, baby. Back away from the gun. Back away from this. Back away from that. But no, you don't want to back away because you know that's not of God because God told you to love your neighbor. God didn't tell you to cast your pearls before a swine. That ain't love. That's being foolish. Wasteful. All right. Now, so I want to share with you. Trust God. His word is true. No matter what, his word is true. And it's good for you. It may taste nasty. It may not be the remedy you were looking for. God may say, you ain't never going to get to that if you don't go through this first. I remember I was telling the Lord when I was making 5 and $6 an hour, 35 years of age. Lord, I want my life to be better. I am, I'm, I'm not complaining, but I am tired of these people nickel and diming me with these little low, low paychecks. Lord, is there any way that I, I'm, I'm talking to the Lord now, listen. Is there any way that I could earn a living and not have to work for someone else? Is there any way I could set my own budget, my own income, my own hours, be free to come and go as I choose and love what I'm doing? Not just tolerate it, not just go through the motions. And the Lord gave me a vision right after I asked that question. Cosmetology. I was not a happy camper. I didn't think that was a great advice. I didn't think that was great news from him. I, I didn't relish the idea of standing on my feet doing hair all day, dealing with all kind of moody women. I don't want to deal with that. But that's what the Lord showed me. I said, well, the Lord knows me better than I know myself. So, Lord, if you really want me to do this, I'll sign up for the class, but and I was already hired to be an interpreter for the deaf at Pasadena City College. I already got hired, got my schedule, and I wasn't to start until September, but I got this word in August. So I said, okay, if you're really in this, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the class, and if I like the class, 
I'll stay. I know it's you. If I don't, and I'm asking you to make me love it, you know, but if I don't like it, I want to know that before two weeks is up so I can get a full refund. By the fourth day, I was in love. I was in my element. I was like, oh, cloud nine, baby. Yeah, I love this. Guess what? I had to kiss that job goodbye and go to school 40 hours a week instead of going to work 40 hours a week. Now I don't have an income. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I already had a few customers. So the Lord just added to it on his own through word of mouth, through going down to the wig shop, meeting some of their clients and being recommended. And I was able to sustain myself while I had no job. But I got a license. Now, I would never have made the money I made as a hairdresser had I not gone to school. And some of you, the whole back is the classes you refuse to take. That's some of your whole back. You got time now, but you won't do it. I don't know why, but you won't. Now, I don't know who you are. But that came to my mind to share that experience. So for those of you on YouTube who know, you know you're supposed to take a class, a course, uh, whatever, to change your career. And God has given you the word, but you're so afraid you don't want to bust the move. Because what about the money? Guess what? Your money's covered, baby. God will cover you. But you'll never know how much he'll cover you till you make the move. Just like the priest, when the parting of the waters was supposed to happen for Joshua, it didn't happen the way it did for Moses. The priest had to step in the water first and get their, their skirts and their shoes and sandals and feet wet before the water began to part. Whole different scenario, same result. Different scenario, different approach. See, God ain't always doing the same thing the same way every time. He's creative. He has the license to change his methods. But the results you can count on, baby. And I'm going to leave you with the results. God bless you as you trust, as you lean, as you believe, as you step out in faith. And go for the gusto, baby, knowing God's got your future, God's got you, and he's got your back. Amen? Amen. <laughs>